hello, I'm Angela Princewell. And I'm Shreen Apti. And we're going to be talking to you about when a divorce is no longer simple. Actually, specifically, when a simple divorce is no longer simple. And what do I mean by that? So for the vast majority of cases that we have, it starts off as an application. Parties are separated. There's a lot of issues to deal with. And um, if, the, if the parties are not able to negotiate a settlement, then we start a court application with all of the all, all of the issues that the parties need to resolve as a result of their separation. There's some cases where, you know, either through negotiations that have happened during mediation or just life, the parties have kind of fallen to a rhythm and time has now passed and one person decides they want a divorce and they're like, well, I'm just going to do a simple divorce because I don't need anything else. Every other issue is kind of fine and I'm just going to do a simple divorce. So it's kind of like an, an application, but it's different because in this case, you're essentially pretty much asking for just a divorce. Well, that's usually all well and good in most cases until it's not. Because if the other side files an answer to your simple divorce application and they make a claim, then now your divorce is not so simple. So obviously there's a number of things they could ask for, but um, we know you have limited time. So we're just going to focus today's um, video on equalization, spousal support, and child support claims. So I'm going to throw it to, to Shireen and um, what happens when a person makes a claim in their answer for equalization. Yeah, so when that happens, automatically your divorce is stalled because there's, you know, it's not like the divorce is just going to proceed. There's now a procedure in place where you can actually now respond to their claim by doing a reply. And then you basically unless it's settled, but most cases are not, you would go to court and you would address them in the different conferences. So if the issue is equalization, you'd have to look at, you know, you'd have to do financial statements back to the date of separation. You'd have to do full financial disclosure. You'd have to go through the steps of if you have pensions, valuing your pensions, you know, depending on how long you've been separated, getting, you know, obviously statements for the date of separation, which if it's been a long time, it becomes its own challenge. You know, if there has been, if there are date of marriage assets that you want to prove, you also have to go through the expense of making sure you get that disclosure. So it's not a simple issue. You do have to address the equalization issue before um, you address the divorce, unless both parties agree to sever that issue from the divorce and allow just the divorce to proceed while you guys still deal with the equalization component. But to make things simple, which it wouldn't be in your situation if equalization comes up in your simple divorce is that it would get complicated. And yeah. it's a yeah. one. And um, to even make that even more interesting is there's times where people have filed answers and then in their answer, they raise claims for equalization seven years after the date of separation. How do we deal with that? Yeah, so it's interesting to note there are time limits to, you know, property division. So equalization specifically is that there is a six year limitation period after the date of separation or two years after a divorce, whichever comes sooner. So that's the timeline that you're looking at. And when you have to deal with someone who's also requesting, you know, an equalization peer payment after the date of um after the date of limitations has surpassed, you also have to deal with the merits of that case too. So you have to go through the steps of whether or not you would set aside the limitation period, you know, what the factors are. And without getting, you know, too complicated, it just becomes more complicated in the sense <laughs> that not only are you dealing with equalization, you also now have to go through the expense of, you know, going after the limitation period, either that being set aside and whether there's merits to do that. And so on and so forth. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. And then um, let's talk spousal support. That's the, that's the major one. I find that people think they could just have a simple divorce and not deal with the issue of spousal support. Yeah, spousal support is an interesting one. And despite as long as it's been, there's no limitation period on support. So that might be a common misconception to most people, you know, and we've had situations where, you know, these parties have not been together for 20 plus years and, or, okay, fine, maybe 20 plus years is a bit of a stretch, but it's not, it has happened. Um, but even let's just say five, six, seven, eight years down the line, they've been separated and maybe this issue never was brought up or no one really, you know, expected the other side to go after the issue of spousal support. 
now you're left with, you know, the responding party now making that claim for spousal support, which also is an added expense. It would delay the process of a divorce and you would have to go, you know, depending on the length of time, retroactive to the date of separation is something I assume most parties do. And that's alone a cost and an expense and a delay. Yep. Definitely not going, making for a simple divorce as, as expected. Um, well, ongoing, I want to talk child support. With ongoing child support, for the most part, when we have clients that come in to get a divorce, we always, that's that's one that you have to deal with. Because most, mostly the courts would not even process that divorce application if it's not clear that you've put your mind to how the children would be provided for financially, correct? Absolutely. And you want to like make a point to know that like just it's not just children as we might perceive them, because often the times it's that, oh, well, they're over 18. There still might be post-secondary expenses. So the general rule is if they're still a dependent child, they still are a child that's eligible to receive child support. So, yes. And then it goes to the same issue. It's an added expense. It's going to delay the process because the court is going to want to deem that that support, the support arrangements for either the responding party or the child are being met prior to advancing with a divorce. Because from the court's perspective, the divorce is not something that is prejudicial. There are, I don't want to overcomplicate it, but there are times in which you can set aside the divorce, or you could ask for the divorce to be severed, maybe because, you know, it's been how many years and you are trying to remarry or you're leaving the country. There are times in which it's appropriate, you know, so if you really do want that divorce, know that you could, as long as it's not prejudicial to the other party. And it's and as long as you know that that simple divorce application it's not, so simple. Not, it's not so simple anymore. Yes, we gotta keep we gotta keep on, on 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 that thought, right? No, I just I think I find that funny, but um, I know that for for people that are going through this, it's a very stressful time. And to be fair, a lot of people that are thinking about just applying for the simple divorce genuinely think that every other issue in their minds has been resolved, right? Either. The number of times that we've had to deal with retroactive child support claims that come up in, an, in a divorce. So, I mean, and it might be inadvertent. Someone thinks, OK, the children are 18. I've been paying X amount of dollars for child support. Um, I don't want to pay anymore. And I'm just going to bring my divorce. And they think that just a simple divorce kind of just deals with all of that. And it really doesn't. For one, they, you know, you may have been underpaying child support, for example. Right. So. If a person makes a claim for retroactive child support, then now you're in, you, you find yourself in a position where you could go back several years now looking at your incomes and adjusting child support to deal with that, right? So it's just, and I know it's a very stressful time. It can be uncertain. It's not fun at all, but it's just, you know, that's our job. We have to, we have to deliver the news, I guess, so. Yeah, and there might be times where, you know, the answer, is, especially if someone doesn't have legal advice um, and they produce an answer with there's no meritless claim like it could be just that oh you put a different date of separation than I agree to but there's no actual claim to be resolved and I've actually had that recently you know it was just to say no you moved out on the house on this day not this it was not the day that you're saying you did but it it doesn't go to anything <laughs> but yeah. realistically like there and there's also times like um I've had a recent file they were separated for over 15 years you know, he proceeded by a simple divorce. The other party just wanted property, like in terms of household contents back in a foreign country that he had stored in his house. And she was asking for, and yes, it's well past the statute of limitations, but it could have been something as simple as, okay, we can negotiate settling that issue, but allow the divorce to proceed while we deal with these residual issues, even though, you know, they're past their limitation period but yeah it could just be so no but sure, that, that could be an interesting issue actually because if you're thinking of the storage of property that belongs to the other side they're not essentially equalizing they're just asking for return of property then you have Household to even, yeah so that's an interesting yeah that's an interesting issue because it's not even equalization in that sense so I mean, I, I guess mean, it is in my, in my, like in the way that I was looking at it, it was equalization. It was content that they both had. Oh, and it didn't had, belong to just one party. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't just one person's property. Of course, like they would have had recourse elsewhere, but yeah. still it wouldn't be appropriate to bring an answer. You know, it would delay the process. You'd have to go through the normal steps of any other court matter, as opposed to just saying, Hey, I, you know, I'm not going to do anything with a divorce. Let it, the divorce proceed. 
we can deal with the residual household exactly. contents or contents after the fact. Um, but yeah, I found that very interesting. And just to say that, like, there are people that will respond and it will un it will automatically delay your court process of getting a divorce if they respond, even if there's no claim. And that's a lot of the time, you know, people get frustrated. They're like, well, there's nothing, there's nothing there, you know, it's just, they just delayed it by default of responding, you know, so the court's not taking your court, your, your application straight up to the judge after the timeline has passed to say, okay, is it granted? Do you have all the paperwork? Here's your divorce. Yeah. So yeah, simple. Instead, as it, yeah. Instead, you're not now caught up doing a reply or not doing a reply, attending conferences, dealing with, with other um, issues. And sometimes, yeah, as you said, if you're trying to get married, things like that, it, it, it adds that extra pressure, not just beyond the cost of having to deal with these issues. But I think I'm going to park it here. But there's a number. I mean, obviously, we've just talked about three examples, but there's other times, right? There's times where parenting arrangements are not structured, for example, and someone wants it structured. Again, I would be with Sharon on this one to say that you don't necessarily have to put it in an answer. That's something that maybe you could deal with. But of course, it depends on the circumstances of the case. And if you've been wanting to bring um, your own court application and now the person's bit you to it by bringing a simple divorce. Well, that's no longer simple. We're going to talk about it. If you prompt the other party and if you're on, you know, speaking terms, I always suggest either speak to, definitely speak to a lawyer before proceeding to a simple divorce because it may not be so simple, but also, you know, gauge where the other person's at too, because it would help assess, you know, because sometimes people are really just like, they don't talk, you know, and, and, and it, it's up to your situation, of course, but it would just be nice to give a heads up if you can. Um, mm -hmm. Some people just really don't know where the other person is. So that's, yes, yeah. you know, makes talking uh, impossible. Yep. Yep. <laughs> And there's different things, right? Some people want, you know, would use that opportunity as, you know, to keep the matrimonial home to themselves, bring damages claim for, for different torts on their family law. And a, and a major one I also find is that's also an opportunity for a lot of people to try to set aside a separation agreement that exists, which is usually sad because a lot of people are thinking, well, we have a separation agreement done. A few years has gone by, now I have to file this simple divorce. And then next thing you know, you have this answer that's come back, which is essentially trying to set aside your separation agreement. And unfortunately, you have to deal with it. I guess there's really no recourse to it. It's just, you just have to accept that it's not going to be that simple. And like everything else, you can either negotiate it, move to, you know, an alternate dispute resolution process or just make get a court to decide and as Shirin had mentioned earlier um, depending on how what your timelines are if this is getting more complex and taking a longer time the divorce can be you can get the divorce um, it can be severed from the other issues but you have to deal with those other issues I think what I'm trying to say is don't think that because you're bringing an application for a divorce that the court is only going to deal with the divorce and if it's not the divorce not the court doesn't deal with anything else no the other party does have a right to make a claim in their answer and the courts will deal with it and will decide whether it has merit or not if, regardless of whether you say it you know it lacks merit right Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So on that note, we'll um, end today's video on this topic and we wish you best of luck. And remember Shireen's advice, if you, before you go ahead to do this, please seek, you know, legal advice to make sure that, you know, the simple divorce application process is for you because there's times where it's even not even appropriate from the get-go, right? And then obviously you can get some guidance on how to deal with the other party and, and make sure that if there's things that need to be negotiated before you file the divorce application, let those be done, make sure everyone's on board and it would save you a lot of stress and definitely a lot of um, costs in um, legal fees. So until next time, it'll be bye for now. Bye.